Welcome to Euro Dollar University with Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Partners. My name is Emil Kalinowski. And if you thought that we were doing these shows for ratings, well, let me disabuse you of that notion because I'm going to read a quote right now from a Real Clear Markets essay by Jeff Snyder that'll invalidate half of our potential audience. So Jeff just doesn't care about making the money or being popular at all. Here it is. Quote, there is no such thing as a petrodollar. There you go. Half of our potential audience is gone, Jeff. Okay, you're, on April 1st, yeah. you wrote this too. That's funny, but it's not an April Fool's joke. There are no petrodollars. Well, petrodollar is. <laughs> plus the focus misses the point. So maybe that was the part we're trying to highlight. The petrodollar. Okay, first, what are we told that it is? And then, ladies and I gentlemen, like you, yeah, go ahead. you tell, like you described it uh, when we talked about this last week. I think you had a really good description of it. And I thought that was really well done, oh. which was that essentially popular conception, mm. if you don't remember, is, got, yeah, yeah. popular conception is that we went from a gold a gold based commodity money system to an oil based commodity money system. And it sounds like, yeah, August of 1971, Nixon gold. September or whatever it was in 1973, the secret arrangement with Saudi Arabia where we bought their oil, they bought our treasure. I mean, all the, it sounds like we went uh, from Bretton Woods 1 to Bretton Woods 2 as some other guy is trying to claim ridiculously too. And you can understand why people have this idea of a petrodollar and why it has proliferated and, and stuck around so very long because what really has happened quite understandably is that we went through a euro dollar transformation decades before that nobody knew it happened. So when we went from closing the gold window to this petro, no, we just had this overriding euro dollar system that people only became aware of in 1973. So it looks like this new monetary order began in 1973, if only because nobody realized it had been in place for almost two decades before then. So the idea of a petrodollar, it makes sense. It's just, it's not true. It isn't actually a thing. It was a silent coup. We didn't know that it took place, that the euro dollar system had taken over from the Bretton Woods system because it took place in the shadows. What took place on the front pages of our financial media and newspapers, Bretton Woods, the petrodollar, the well, remember arrangement. Too, it's, it's the same as today, where what goes, what gets printed in the newspaper comes from those in position of authority at the Fed or at the Treasury Department. And as we're going to talk about here, as we talk about all the time, those in position of authority didn't know it was going on at the same time anyway. So the newspapers were not going to get any useful information from the Fed because the Fed didn't realize what was happening either. And even as they did start to realize there was this euro dollar thing out there, they didn't really understand what was going on in it either. This should sound very familiar to, to anybody listening to our show today, too, because not much has changed on that account either. So, again, you can understand we get to the mid 1970s. People are seeing this. There's dollars outside the U.S. There's oil involved. There's treasuries. There's all of these things going on. It must have been a radical transformation in 1970 that must have been the date this happened when in fact it wasn't it was the euro dollar was already it was already massive long before oil and it was already almost 20 years old by then it's unsettling that such a much greater more radical transformation could take place with essentially quote unquote nobody noticing and that's why we we want to hold on to that idea that it was the petrodollar cuz that was visible the punchline, Jeff, is going to be that we went from the Bretton Woods gold system, then we were we did this petrodollar thing, and the punchline is that this huge new change, this unbelievable explosion of dollars that were now visible offshore, in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, everywhere else, was easily absorbed into the pre-existing shadow money system, the euro dollar system. It just slotted right in like it was nothing. And it was, that's the thing. I mean, it was nothing. It was nothing. And the reason why is because the petrodollar was not a creation of dollars. It was a redistribution of them. I think I quoted from the BIS in the 1974, 95. You know, by the way, everything here is publicly available. There's no private, no secret letters, no conspiracy, none of that crap. This is all publicly available data that you just 
it's BIS, it's IMF, it's the Federal Reserve, all right there available for anybody who wants to see it. And so the BIS in 1974, 1975 said, look, this oil price shock, this OPEC embargo, all it did was redistribute dollars from oil importers to oil exporters. So the euro dollar was doing a lot of business with the oil importers because they ended up being rich. The oil exporters were not at that time because oil prices were very low. And in fact, in a, for a brief digression here, the whole reason we have LIBOR was because of Iran in the late 60s was out of money. And so this euro dollar system invented LIBOR as a way for Iran to borrow in the euro dollar market to finance large scale energy projects. So the euro dollar was doing a lot of business with oil importers. 1973 oil shock, it starts doing a lot of business with oil exporters and then redistributing back to oil importers in the form of credit. There was no radical change in the way the euro dollar operated except for redistributing who was in what role. Where oil exporters used to be the borrowers, suddenly they were depositors. And where oil importers used to be the depositors, suddenly they became the borrowers. And the euro dollar was in the middle of it all the entire time. So to tell that story, we're going to go back in time before the petrodollar was created, supposedly. Read some quotes from the BIS and meeting minutes of the Federal Reserve to give the audience a sense of what was happening in the euro dollar system. Then we're going to talk about exactly what happened when the, as you just said, Jeff, all of a sudden this money appeared out of nowhere, but it was a redistribution. And then we'll wrap up. Okay, here we go. So let me read from your essay here. Many times during those early 60s discussions, raising the euro dollar subject or euro currency as it was written, the FOMC blamed the country's, America's, balance of payments deficit as its sole source. I'm going to read a quote here. March 1962, memorandum of discussion. Quote, everyone would agree, Vice Chairman Alfred Hayes thought, that the basic solution was in remedying the U.S. balance of payments at such a time as it was demonstrated that the U.S. was doing that, the desire for gold would fade away. The holding of dollars had served to promote a degree of world liquidity that could never have been achieved if everyone held gold. Uh, what does that, all that mean? Tell us. That right there is the that well, that last sentence. You should read that again okay. because that's everything. That is Triffin's paradox. That is the euro dollar in its essence. The holding of dollars had served to promote a degree of world liquidity that could never have been achieved if everyone held gold. That's the euro dollar. And so the problem here in 1962 is the Fed, which is only looking inside the United States, is wondering where the hell all of these dollars outside the United States are coming from. They don't know. And so they figure, well, it's got to be this merchandise deficit that we keep, the balance of payment problem. We're exporting dollars outside the U.S. That must be where this is all coming from. Well, that just wasn't true. That was their primitive worldview, unable to cope with this euro dollar evolution, which was the reason for this evolution was that sentence right there. Triffin's paradox distilled into a single sentence, which was that the Bretton Woods gold exchange mechanism could not supply the money, the globalizing, a prosperous, prosperous world needed. Rebuilding. That, you know, it, it could never happen. So the euro dollars invented a way to solve Triffin's paradox, and it did it by this conspiracy of silence, or under this conspiracy of silence, where this bank ledger money, that wasn't really dollars, there's dollar denominated, there's no physical Federal Reserve notes, there's no gold here. So essentially, this bank-centered ledger money had begun uh, solving Triffin's paradox even before there was a paradox, and long before officials got to realize it. Because as the Fed realized, these this offshore flood of dollar liquidity was doing something that the world actually needed it to do. We were rebuilding after the Second World War, we had a baby boom. The economy, the global economy was booming, roaring. The future was so bright, Jeff. For and as you know, as a student of globalization and waves of globalization, mm. it wasn't everybody was growing, but it was, we were all growing together. We were getting closer, more inter, interconnected, more trade, more financial flows. And that's really the euro dollar secret was to be the ability to flexibly intermediate between all of these various needs as they were needed. And so here we have in 1962, the Fed actually recognizing, we don't know where all these dollars are coming from, but they're really doing us a favor here. 
And the globalization doesn't come first, Jeff. It comes second. The first thing you need is money, liquidity, credit, collateral. But it was supposed to be tied to gold. But there wasn't enough. If you're going to exchange it all, there wasn't enough gold to back all the money that was needed for the globalization because of the demographic boom, because of the rebuilding. And so what happened? We'll just make it up. Some British banks, some European and Japanese banks started saying, we promise we'll get the dollars if you need them, but you won't need them. So let's just work off of ledgers. Okay, July 1963, FOMC, quote, yet in the past few years, the treasurers of large corporations had become international operators. They were no longer going to sit by in the same way as the 10 or 15 years ago, which by the way, would put it 1948 to 1953, right on the cusp, right? 10 to 15 years ago, they would sit by. 48 to 53. But then starting in the mid 50s, they said, no, 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 we need to, we need to make investments, expand, we need money, where are we going to get it from? The development of the euro dollar market to its present magnitude had been a reflection of these activities. Again, the private banks go first, then corporations start to get in the euro dollar. And then years later, the Fed and the BIS and all these others come around and say, hey, there's something going on out there. Maybe we should take a look at it. And even then, they don't really understand what they're looking at. It's repeated history. I have this, uh, this part highlighted here, and I have the word W-U-T question mark after it. It's from the BIS 1964 34th Annual Report, and it says, quote, In addition, some lending of euro currencies has clearly had nothing to do with international trade. For instance, some U.S. security dealers and brokers have been borrowing in the euro dollar market instead of from banks in New York. What is the message? What should we take away here? That might be the most important passage of all of the passages we get to. Okay. What that said was that the euro dollar market had become a comprehensive whole by the time the BIS finally got around to it. Because you have securities dealers inside the U.S. funding their credit activity, which is floating corporate credit, corporate bonds, or municipal bonds, by borrowing outside the United States in the euro dollar market. So we already have security seamlessly integrated into this global reserve system, which is a huge, huge part of it, especially when you realize securities dealers also buy U.S. treasuries from the government and sell them all to other places around the world, including places in the Middle East. So long before we get to 1973, we have a note from the BIS which says, even securities dealers are heavily involved in the euro dollar market, financing all of these activities because it's create this euro dollar market is no longer a market. It is a global reserve system that offers intermediation capabilities across the entire economic and financial landscape. No longer tied to US, no longer tied to domestic, outside, offshore, sufficient size, sufficient capabilities, sufficient depth and sophistication all there available. And this is the early 1960s. We started talking about balance of payments, that that was the official perspective. That where, that's where these dollars were coming from. And so the Nixon administration felt that if they delinked from gold and let f- currencies float, that would solve the balance of payments crisis and therefore put a halt to this dollar expansion and reduce inflation, perhaps. Quote, and now, now we're in the BIS 1974 report talking about balance of payments and whether or not that has anything to do with the euro dollar origins. Quote, contrary to what had frequently been expected, floating exchange rates and the shift of the U.S. balance of payments from deficit to surplus do not seem to have exerted a major drag on the euro dollar market. In fact, even after allowance is made for purely seasonal influences, its growth appears to have accelerated in the second half of 1973. Shocking. They had no idea what they were talking about, right? The entire, the entire decade of the 60s, let's fix our balance of payment problems. This offshore dollar goat withers up and dies. Well, they finally did that. They, they allowed the U.S. dollar to float. They severed the gold connection. The balance of payment issue in the, in the uh, early 70s started to diminish to the point where it should have done what they thought they were going to do if it was any way, in any way realistic. But here the BIS is admitting a couple years later, yeah, that didn't happen. It wasn't a balance of payment issue. This euro dollar system, this euro dollar market, as they called it, 
seems to be unimpeded by anything that the U.S. government or U.S. authorities do in one direction or another. And let's not forget, throughout the 1960s, to, uh, it's not included in the essay here, but throughout the 1960s, the U.S. government tried several times capital controls to stifle the euro dollar market, and obviously that had no effect either, which reinforces the other major theme here, private bank money, not government money. This is not a government system. So it isn't up to President Nixon to decide what the, what the global reserve currency is going to be because the euro dollar system had already done it. Nixon was only acting in reflection of what had happened two decades or almost two decades beforehand. So when we go from 71 to 73, again, nothing radical happened in 1973 except for the redistribution toward oil exporting states. If I remember correctly, one of those capital controls was that U.S. citizens were no longer allowed to own gold overseas as well. Outrageous. Outrageous. Okay. But there were so many others. Ooh, so many other capital controls, and it was a failure. Okay, moving along, BIS 1974, they note that this absorbative capacity of euro dollar loan syndication was of particular importance in 1973 because of increasing recourse to the euro currency, together with the increasing volume of borrowing for the financing of large energy related projects. Finally, now we're getting to the energy portion of our discussion. Jeff, I'm about to read out some of the numbers regarding the, the redistribution of money that took place when oil prices spiked. Anything I should know or anything we need to tell the audience before we read these numbers? No, I just, these are large numbers. And so again, you could understand why somebody who doesn't, who isn't aware of all of these developments says something big happened here because these are, you know, I think the number is something like 30 billion, 30 billion dollars in 1973, that was a lot. And so you see this $30 billion suddenly show up from the oil exporting nations, these OPEC nations, and you think, I don't know, you're not aware of the euro dollar system, so you think this is something brand new that has happened. So it must be important, and the government must be involved because of Nixon, because of everything else. And if you're not aware of the euro dollar that's lurking behind all this in the shadows, it does look like it's a substantial break, when in fact it's really not. It's just we're not seeing the overall big picture. It's almost like it's like looking at the tip of the iceberg. You don't see the vast majority that's below the surface of the water. But if this suddenly this massive part sticking out of the water comes upon you, like the uh, like the lookouts on the Titanic, yeah, that looks that it, it can be a very big problem or a very it can look more substantial than it really is. Okay, here it is. Here are some numbers. BIS calculations, 1975, the 45th annual report. Reported reserves by oil exporting nations had surged by a whopping 34.4 billion in 1974 compared to gains of just 3.2 and 4.4 billion in 1972 and 1973. All this had represented was a redistribution, the taking away from oil importing countries. These latter had reported increases in reserves of 20.1 billion in 1972 and 15.3 billion in 1973, but just 1.8 billion in 1974. Quote from the BIS, the great bulk of their reserve gains was placed in the euro currency market. It was just absorbed into a pre-existing system. Yeah, and they're referring to the oil exporting nation. So we had we had money and dollars and loans going into oil importers, and suddenly the oil price rises and then it flows to oil exporters, and then that thirty billion or so dollars, and then it kept up through the rest of the seventies. But that thirty billion initial surge of reserves that ended up in the hands of the OPEC nations, the oil exporting nations, the vast majority, as it says, the vast majority of which went into the euro currency market, and then the majority of that bought treasuries because that's what the euro currency market or the euro dollar system does. The euro dollar system as a whole, part of the discussion we need to raise, and maybe this is a good time to do it, is really more about the medium of exchange. And so if you're looking for store of value, the euro dollar system developed these securities, euro bonds or U.S. treasuries, which is why the, all that quote that we mentioned before, how securities dealers borrowing the euro dollar, that is, a connect, that is the connection here between the medium of exchange and the store of value stuff. So you have a lot of reserves 
coming into, say, Saudi Arabia, the euro, your euro dollar system will absorb those reserves. You can keep them on deposit with euro dollar banks. And if you're not going to use them right away, buy a U.S. treasury. Because we've, we're selling them out all the way around the world anyway. I mean, we talked about before how Japan, Japan in the early 1960s was forced to sell T-bills to make up for a local euro dollar shortfall. We didn't call it the auto dollar because the, suddenly the Japanese were selling autos all over the world and buying treasury bills with the proceeds. It's because it was the euro dollar system that had, that had arisen long before then to offer all of these monetary, these, these global reserve capabilities to anyone who was involved in the system. And it just so happened in 1973 that countries like Saudi Arabia finally joined the club of the wealthy and so were able to take advantage of this system that had existed for two decades by then. But because of the geopolitical implications, because there was this clear connection from gold to oil, it was easy to just say, aha, Gold back dollar, petro back dollar. Last quote from me, Jeff. This is your quote. These events did not create an entirely new currency as the petrodollar term alleges. Rather, a few new entrants into the wealthy national club were welcomed into the existing and by then well established global euro dollar framework. The existing euro dollar network, offshore bank centered reserveless money, merely extended oil producers the same full range capacities that it had developed over nearly 20 years of massive, unrecognized expansion before 1973. That's it for me, Jeff. This is just why we call it shadow money, right? Because even here, it existed in the shadows that nobody paid much attention, nobody really appreciated. And so because it's hidden in the shadows, people are trying to make sense of the world as it actually is. Again, we, we understand why people use the term petrodollar. We're sympathetic to it because even by using the term petrodollar, even though it's a mistake, you're at least further ahead than those people who think the money is all in the Fed because you're seeing offshore, there's something else going on. Treasuries are involved. You're seeing a fleeting glimpse of this, you know, a very, very, you know, the, the part of the iceberg that's sticking up out of the water. You're seeing a small part of the entire euro dollar system that goes far more beyond just the price of oil or just the trade of oil. Thank you very much, Jeff. Take care, Emil.